Holy words. The Glendale Road Church of Christ proudly presents a weekly exploration of the Word of our living God. This is It Is Written with Minister Stephen Hunter. Oh, let the ancient words One of the uh, defining acts of salvation in addition to, to others is belief or faith. Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There are some in certain traditions that believe that uh, uh, when infants are born, that they are born into a corrupt world, and they are born inheriting the sin of Adam, uh, or of Eve, if you will, or both of them. And because of that, they are in need of cleansing through salvation, uh, through baptism, uh, so that they can be cleansed of their sins. But in the Bible, there is a picture that's presented. If you want to look at another couple of passages with me, the first is Deuteronomy chapter one, verse thirty-nine. Or you can feel free to just write it in your notes if you prefer. Deuteronomy one, verse thirty-nine. Moses wrote, "Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims." who today have no knowledge of good and evil. They shall go in there, and them I will give it, and they shall possess it. And so what I want to point out in Deuteronomy 1.39 is Moses pointing out that the little ones or the children in this case, they have no knowledge of good and evil. We see this also presented in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 15. Obviously, centuries later, written uh, Isaiah chapter 7, Verse 15 says, Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the good and choose, that he may know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. So again, there's this depiction, uh, first of all, of children not knowing to choose good or evil uh, and not even being able to discern between them. The whole idea that each of us are born with the stain of Adam's sin is a doctrine that originates uh, usually from a particular church father as he's regarded called Augustine or Augustine. And he, in his earlier writings, uh, held one view, but later in his life, uh, he came to adopt this view more so, uh, that of each of us when we're born, we're born stained with sin inherently. However, the Bible, I think, presents a different picture. But those who hold to this doctrine, they think it's necessary for their children to be baptized. And in the East, they do practice immersion on the babies. Uh, but in the West, there are various versions where they're not immersed. They're sprinkled or chris. Chrismation is what the name of the ceremony is called. So what I want to do is present some of the arguments that they hold to, uh, justifying why they practice what they practice, and I'd like to answer those. Uh, and then after that, I want to look at uh, uh, just a couple more passages relative to what the Bible emphasizes as us needing to have faith to be born again of water and spirit. And finally, I want to show you where in history this idea began that it was necessary for children to be baptized. So if you want to open your Bibles and follow along with me, uh, the first thing we'll look at is the argument from household baptisms. And in Acts chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, the conversion of Cornelius' household is where we'll begin. And so if you want to follow along, feel free to do so. In Acts 11, verses 13 and 14, this is what we read. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He'll tell you words by which you and all your household shall be saved. Now, the argument is, when you consider what households were made up of, you had obviously uh, adults, you would have your father who would be over the household, then you would have a mother and maybe even servants or slaves, depending on the wealth of the household, 
And then the argument goes from there and say, well, households had children as well. And so as you notice these household conversions, particularly with Cornelius, you can read about it in Acts chapter 10, you know, it stands to reason that in the household there might have been children. And so compelling enough an argument. Secondly, you look at Lydia in Acts 16 verse 15. And it says here, when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. A little bit later, you see the story of the Philippian jailer in the same chapter, Acts 16, verse 33. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and his family or household were baptized. Then you go ahead to Acts 18, verse 18, and the household of Crispus. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla, oops, I think I'm looking at the wrong verse. Or I wrote, that says Acts 18, 8. If I'd read my own notes, things would go a lot better. Acts 18, 8. My apologies. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. And finally, Stephanus in 1 Corinthians 1, 16. Paul says here, writing to the Corinthians, Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. And so when you hear the argument from one particular side, they say, well, you read about several household baptisms in the New Testament. And this is true. And they contend that, you know, making up that household, you would have had parents. You likely would have had children. Maybe multi-generational, because it wasn't uncommon for several generations to live in a house. It could be that you had... Uh, you could have a, a, a father who was in his 50s or 60s with his wife and their firstborn son who would inherit the estate. He and his wife and their children might live in the same household in addition to servants or slaves. And so the argument's often made that, you know, well, in the household there would have been children. And so when households were baptized, children would have been baptized too. But one thing I would urge is if you go and read not just these one or two verses pertaining to household baptisms, but several verses before and after, you'll notice that faith is nearly always present. For example, the Philippian jailer asked Peter and all those with him, men and brethren, what shall I do to be saved? And he said, believe in the Lord, you and all your household. So there's faith attached uh, to, as a prerequisite to baptism. A second argument is that circumcision is depicted as akin to baptism in the New Testament. In Colossians 2, 11-12, Paul writes, In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism. Here's where the two are equivocated. Uh, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. And so, in addition to household baptisms, you have circumcision equated to baptism. And then the question comes, well, when were Jewish males circumcised? And you read your Old Testaments and you, you find that they were circumcised on the eighth day the eighth day of their life. And so, well, if they were made members of the covenant when they were young, uh, it stands to reason that uh, young people, children, would be made members of the new covenant through Christ our Lord. The only problem with that is only the males were circumcised. So is it just infant boys that are supposed to be baptized or immersed? So uh, there's another argument you, you think about too. Uh, Another one, you look at the many references to children in the Gospels. Uh, For example, Matthew 18, verses 1 through 3. Jesus was around with all of His disciples, and they asked Him, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
And so what he did, he brought a child before all of them, and he set the child in the presence of them. And essentially, he pointed out to this group of apostles this child before him, and he said, you have to become like this child. And he actually gives a stipulation saying, unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so the argument goes, well, you consider how highly esteemed children were uh, in those times, especially by Jesus Christ Himself. That only goes to prove the point even further, some will contend. But then on top of that, they'll add Luke 18, 16, when parents were bringing their children to Jesus. And uh, the disciples were rebuking them because of this. And Jesus essentially said, Hinder not or suffer not the little ones to come to Me for such is the kingdom of heaven. And so you look at some of these references to children and uh, circumcision equated to baptism and also household baptisms. And so the, the argument is made by some people that, you know, children should be baptized. Well, think about this. First of all, the whole premise has to do with the doctrine of original sin, uh, which is a doctrine that doesn't appear until the 5th century. And by the way, I'll add to this, this particular doctrine, original sin, that was developed in the 5th century was taken up by, John, by Martin Luther first, then by John Calvin, and was eventually made parts of their theologies that have trickled down throughout history. Now, the Calvinism that you see today, if you're into keeping up with such trends, isn't like the Calvinism of early America. Uh, there's actually a book that I have in my library. Uh, it's called The Wrath of God, by, uh, published by the University of Kentucky Press. And the fellow in there, he details what Calvinism was like in early America. And it's vastly different than what you'll see today. But it ultimately is traced back historically. The thought is traced back to John Calvin, who took it from Martin Luther in, you're talking 15, 1600s. And then you go all the way back. And both of those guys, if you read their writings, were big fans of Augustine. Now before you doze off, it's like, wow, this is like a college lecture. Well, whenever you're suffering trying to put a sermon together and you're struggling with it, yeah, just lecture it. It'll be all right. But this is where, how you can trace the thought process. And last week we looked at what is this confession? What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? Um, you know, a lot of these things, when you follow the timeline and you follow the thought process, this is how some of these distortions come to be. Uh, and it starts at one point and then it goes further and further onward. And this really is, if anything, should be a compelling argument for keeping sound doctrine and for upholding what the Bible teaches. And it's not to say that those people don't. They just have a particular interpretive history of certain passages, just like what we do. But the thing is, you can look at Scripture and you can make Scripture say what you want it to say, but you can look at Scripture as well as history, and there you'll have an even better, in my opinion, you'll have an even better idea of what's going on. And so, faith is constantly highlighted all throughout the Bible. Acts 10.43, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Jesus said in that great commission recorded in Mark, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And so what's funny is we have one segment in broader Christian thought that emphasizes faith, but sometimes their emphasis on faith is so great that they go, well, let's just dehydrate baptism altogether. You really don't even need it. And then you have another segment that is totally devoid of faith and say you've got to do the work. And you've got to do it as soon as you're born. And so if Jesus believes that children are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and if some teach that children are born with sin, this original sin, ultimately what we're coming to find out is they believe somehow or another, well... The greatest in the kingdom of heaven is just a bunch of little demons. 
I thought that was funny. I've raised children. I think you have too. And I think you probably at one point or another going, I understand why some species eat their young, right? I know I've said that on many occasions. But the fact is, when you look at the innocence of children, when you look at the sweetness of children and their purity of heart, and the fact that even in the Old Testament, they are unable to discern good from evil, let, let, let's make some practical application on that point before we go further. It is our jobs as parents and grandparents to help them discern between what is good and what is evil. I spoke to a therapist years ago and they gave me a little bit of insight into this. And, you know, we were talking about bringing up children as Christians, teaching them to love the Lord, teaching them to follow the Lord best that we can. And this therapist ultimately said to me, you know, here's something you have to realize. Children see mom and dad as God before they will see God as God. And they said, now I don't mean that to be... Bla this was a Christian counselor. They said, I don't say that to be blasphemous, but I say it to make a point. They're looking ultimately to you. And so, what we teach them, what we model for them, will help shape who they become. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions where we do our level best, and then they go off and you go, I, I don't know what happened. I, I, can, I can't tell you how many times parents have said to me, I raised them the same way. I don't know what happened. Everybody has free will. That's what happens. Adam and Eve had free will. They had the ideal conditions. They had perfect fellowship with God. They had every need of theirs ever met, but God made them with free will so that they could choose. Compelling somebody to love you isn't sincere love. I was speaking with someone a few weeks ago, and they grew up in one of these traditions where they are baptized as an infant or, or chrismated, whatever the term would be that's appropriate. And they're not a practicing churchgoer. So we were having this conversation, and, and I, I, you know, they said, of course, their, their parents were not thrilled at all by their views. And, and then they gave me the, the, the line that I've heard from so many people that I still have yet to understand. I'm spiritual but not religious. I, what, what even does that mean? I have no clue. And so as we dove further into what they mean by that, uh, this person ultimately said, you know, I don't believe that you got to sit in a building on a Sunday. And I said, well, I don't believe that either. But, you know, just sitting in a building on a Sunday, you know, if that's how you view worship, then there's part of the problem. And that's probably some of the views that some of you may even have. Well, we could just go sit in that building. Come on, let's get up and go. I don't want to go. Well, we got to go to church. You don't got to do anything. I tell you, this morning would have been perfect to sleep in. Amen? Oh, I would have loved it. And guess what? I got one of those metal roofs. Do you know what rain sounds like on a metal roof? It is so relaxing. I mean, you just want to keep on honk shoeying. You know what honk shoe? Honk shoey, that's snoring, okay? My poor wife has to put in earplugs now. Apparently, I've become such a violent snorer, but you don't care. Nevertheless, as this person and I were talking, they, they made a statement that really caught my attention. They said, I don't know what church I'd go to if I had to choose. I said, aha. I said, what? That's the thing. You didn't get to choose, did you? No. Their religion was chosen for them by their parents. Not to say that's a bad thing. You know, if, I, if, 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 if it was within my ability, I know I, I would make a lot of choices for my children. Not while they're young, but even when they're old, right? Because I know better. Uh-huh. Some of you meddling parents. Let them make their choices. 
I told Brianna the other day, I said, you know, when you get to a certain age, you can do what you want, when you want, how you want. I said, I will just hope that your mother and I will have done a good enough job in laying you a solid foundation that you do what pleases God, not what pleases me. Please God first, always. Don't worry about pleasing me. Because I'm, I'm so temperamental. You know, I have been asked on occasion, is there anything that anybody can do to please you? You ever had that said to you, husbands? Is there anything that will please you? Yes, chocolate chip cookies. Every time. Amen. Thank you. But see, God doesn't want us, I believe, to be coerced into following Him. God wants us to make the choice. And so faith isn't something I can force upon somebody else by making them do what I think they ought to do. Faith, rather, is something that has to be cultivated. It begins with planting a seed. The seed we would esteem as such is the Word of God, Luke chapter 8, and then you nurture that. And what we hope happens is that faith will grow as a result. But if we don't nurture it, it will never grow. As parents, we can sometimes easily nurture certain seeds in the lives of our children that have nothing whatsoever to do with faith. For me, it was fishing and hunting. And those are good skills to have, I think. I mean, after all, my last name is Hunter. I might as well be one. Right? Otherwise, what's the point? But there were times that, you know, we would go during deer season. We would go stay at my aunt's and uncle's and uh, out in Trousdale County, Hartsville, Tennessee. A lot of hills out there. And uh, all the deer that I killed out there, I had to drag uphill to get over the hill to where the home was. If you've never drug a deer uphill, it, it can, it's a good leg workout, I'll tell you. But during deer season, that's where we were every weekend. And church wasn't a priority. God wasn't a priority. Deer hunting was. Same thing when it came for duck season. I used to love to duck hunt, but now I'm just so lazy. I don't want to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to go sit outside in the frigid cold and shoot a bunch of dumb birds. I'd much rather stay under my electric blanket, wake up and drink coffee and watch Mountain Men on a Saturday morning. But when Sunday comes, what is it that we are nurturing not just for our children, but also for us? And we all have a host of excuses that would be a lot easier to use as to why we're not here. I want you to think for just a second. Let me, let me urge you to ask, and I promise I'm going to move on, but let me urge you to ask yourself a few questions. If I showed the same amount of dedication to my job that I give to God, would I still have a job come Monday morning? Let me say it again, because you go, wait, wait what, what, what was that? If I showed the amount of dedication to my job that I showed to my God, would I still have a job come Monday morning? Now that's one of those good self-examination questions. You know, I got berated yesterday because I was two minutes late. And the reason I was two minutes late to an event 
was because on 121 heading toward New Concord, I got stuck behind a convoy of four vehicles doing 40 miles an hour. Now, y'all know I don't do the speed limit as it is, but I certainly do not transgress the suggestion, at least go this fast. 40 miles an hour in 121. And it's so windy that there wasn't any place safe enough for me to pass all four of them. And so then I arrived to my event and was berated for being three minutes late. Now, I'm not going to say Tara Weber's name, but what was this preacher said about coming to church on time? I was like, well, okay. Good thing that's not my job because I'd have got fired from it. But seriously, ask yourself that question. If I gave the same amount of devotion and dedication to my sports as I give to my God, would we be a winning or a losing team? We often are willing to give our best to so many things, and what we give to God is leftovers. To Him all the prophets witness that through His name, whoever believes in Him will receive remission of sins. God wants us to have faith. He wants us to have a devotion to Him and not a devotion that's half-hearted. I'll throw in another question. If I showed the amount of devotion to my spouse that I showed to God, would I still have a marriage? I mean, boy, I could keep on going. Confession is a constant highlight as well. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So faith is constantly emphasized in our New Testaments. As is confession. Neither of these two things can be done by such little ones. First of all, they've not yet develop the mental capacity to have faith. And it's all they can do to say mom or dad, let alone say, I believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. So where did all this come about? I will say this, while some will make compelling arguments from different scriptures or passages in the New Testament, there is no explicit reference to infants being baptized. And again, with the household baptisms, I'd encourage you to read around each of those passages because I think what you'll find is that faith is often attached uh, to, to several of those passages. So, uh, first and earliest deviation from this that I could find occurs in AD 189. Irenaeus was a bishop of Lyons, and uh, he's got this voluminous work called Against Heresies. And a lot of that work is good stuff, but this is what he says. For he came to save himself, excuse me, for he came to save all through means of himself, all, I say, who through him are born again to God, infants and children and boys and youths and old men. Now, I'll say this. I, you know, the Great Commission, I do believe, it extends to everybody. Uh, it's not just for adults. It's not just for the aged or teenagers. It is for everyone. So I would go so far as to say, yeah, he died for them too. But they've not yet come to a point of recognizing their sinfulness. They've not yet come to a point of developing sincere, genuine faith in Christ. All right, another passage. Hippolytus uh, in AD 215 wrote, Baptize first the children, and if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Otherwise, let their parents or other relatives speak for them. So the, the practice came to be that when the infants or the babies were uh, baptized, that it was the parents who spoke faith rather than the children professing their faith in Christ. And so this is something that developed and really took hold. And you see in later writings. These are the earliest two that, that I have seen. But, but let me 
give a word of caution in wrapping up. Just because we do not practice infant baptism or chrismation, uh, we believe that faith is essential. We believe that confession is essential. Calling on the name of the Lord, if you will. Uh, I, I want us to be careful that we don't swing so far to the opposite extreme that when our little children come and speak to us about wanting to be saved or about wanting to be baptized, that we just shut them down. I, I think that is a bad practice. Uh, I think if they are interested about it, I, let's sit down and talk about it. Let's read the Bible together and, and let's discern where we are. But when I used to, as a teenager, go to church camp, there would be some younger children that would want to be baptized. Uh, they would believe in Jesus. They had no problem confessing Him. But then the counselors would call the parents back home and the parents would say, don't do it. They're not old enough. And so that's okay. That's fine. But <clears throat> please come talk to your children. Don't just say you're not old enough and just shut it down right there. Because what happens is some children grow up believing, well, mom and dad have already shut me down, but yet it's supposed to be this joyous thing when others do it, but yet I've been told no, and maybe they just let it go. Or maybe it kills their excitement for Jesus. One of the things that some here have done and, and I've mentioned this before, and I'll mention it again. Uh, there's a book written by, by Kyle Butt and John Farber, and the, the name of the book is Am I Ready to Be Baptized? Both of my children read it, and it helped them a lot. It's written on a, a, a child's level. And I know that there are others. Uh, Tim has used it with his children. Uh, Monica uh, uh, and Daniel, others have used it with their children. And it, it really is a very helpful little tool. It doesn't replace the Bible, but it's a great aid when those conversations and those questions arise. So, we want to avoid either extreme and thinking, well, they're born with sin, they need to be saved. Well, if that is the case, what about, what about miscarriages? And what about stillbirths? And even the folks who, who advocate infant baptism, when you ask them about... Uh, you know, stillbirths or, or, or miscarriages, uh, the, the few that I've spoken with have always said to me, essentially, well, we have to depend on God's grace. I think that's as much of true of anyone in the womb, outside the womb, and after salvation. Here's one thing I know. In the end, I and you Christian or not. But even as a Christian, I am as liable and subject to the same grace of God as every other living person. And so it's not my place to judge. It's not my place to point the finger and say, you're going to hell, you're going to heaven. I am thankful that God is the one who decides that matter. But I do know that He has said, this is what I want you to do. And in as much as we know what God would have us to do, brethren, that's exactly what we ought to do. If anyone is subject to the invitation, we invite you to come forward and we'll minister to you as we stand and sing. This has been It Is Written, presented by the Glendale Road Church of Christ. We welcome your visits and communications at any time. With God's own heart, oh, let the ancient words impart.